So welcome to this webinar that's on medical device regulatory market access in times of a national emergency, hosted by the University of Illinois and by UL and Amargo by UL. I'm Laura Frericks and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Illinois Research Park and Director of Economic Development at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We're thrilled to have so many of you join us today for this important topic, and we know that it is a time of unprecedented working conditions and also inspiring stories of many companies, entrepreneurs, and inventors coming together to try to use their talents and expertise, engineering skills, or manufacturing capabilities to try to address this national pandemic with the different medical needs that are continuing to arise. And so thank you for having uh, the opportunity to join us probably from your home today, as you see our homes in the background as well, as we all try to work together and gain the expertise needed to address these challenges. Thank you for all the different participants from companies, whether you're a small company that's trying to contribute or a large organization, a healthcare system, or from a university. We're also grateful to all our university incubator partners throughout the state that joined us as part of the Illinois University Incubator Network, where we continue to provide resources to different entrepreneurs that we'll highlight at the end of this meeting as well. So today, we did ask the company, UL, based in the state of Illinois, to be the experts, and they'll be introducing themselves. We have five expert speakers today that will address a variety of topics and will be moderated today by Stuart Eisenhart. He will be helping to go through this discussion, and we do ask that you use the chat feature to be able to submit your questions. If you're familiar with Zoom, that chat feature is at the bottom of your screen, and you will be able to see it as an icon that'll allow you to submit questions either to everyone as you type them, and those will be visible to all the participants, or directly if you find Stuart Eisenhart as the moderator, you can privately send him a message as well. These five experts will be covering topics from clinical and other QMS documentation, human factors concerns, applicable standards, applicable certifications, and cybersecurity. And we also would like the chance for a more open discussion starting at three o'clock. When these presentations conclude, we'll have a chance for you to unmute yourself and ask questions to these experts and hopefully have a discussion amongst the different participants today. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Stuart Eisenhart. He is a manager of copy and editorial at UL Life and Health Sciences with 20 years experience in communications, and he's going to help kick off this discussion and introduce each of our experts today. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much, Laura, for the introduction, and thanks to everyone who is attending the webinar today. As Laura said, my name is Stuart Eisenhart with UL Life and Health Sciences. I'll be moderating today's webinar. And as you know, we'll be discussing key considerations and challenges that non-medical manufacturers are facing as they step in to try to help alleviate medi medical device supply shortages in the midst of the pandemic we're going through. We've included subject matter, matter experts from our medical device consulting and advisory business, as well as experts from UL's testing and certification division to address major factors companies will need to deal with in order to rapidly produce needed devices and equipment during the, according to US FDA, and other healthcare regulatory entities. We'll start off with our consulting business and our speakers on that side will include uh, first Audrey Swearingen, Regulatory Affairs Manager at Amergo by UL's Market Access Division, who will be discussing FDA emergency use authorization issues for manufacturers. That will be followed by Michael Wickland, our General Manager of Amergo by UL's Human Factors Research and Design Division who will cover, cover human factors engineering as well as usability concerns. Audrey? Um, so I wanna start out today with a, uh, a brief summary of the FDA's authority and then look at the current emergency use authorizations in place and elements from the FDA's guidance document on emergency use authorizations or EUAs, as well as other FDA actions. As you're probably aware, there's a great deal of information available on the FDA's website. Um, and so we obviously cannot cover it all, but I want to provide links to relevant sources of information so that you are able to further review these and, and stay up to date. Um, one can also subscribe to receiving daily updates from the FDA as well. Next slide. So what is the FDA's authority in times of national health emergencies? Next. 
The Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Reauthorization Act of 2013, or POPRA, grants the FDA authority to support the availability of medical countermeasures or MCMs in times of crisis. And an MCM is basically, or a medical countermeasure, is, is any regulated um, product by the FDA that may be used in the event of a public health threat. So it's devices, drugs, biologics, et cetera, although we're focusing today primarily on, um, well, mostly on, on devices itself. So the POPRA allows the FDA to issue emergency use authorizations of devices for unapproved uses, as well as to implement emergency use policies for approved devices. And it permits government stakeholders, such as cities, um, to stockpile MCMs in order to prepare for emergencies and have rapid deployment of those in the case of the uh, particular health crisis. Next slide. So moving on to emergency use authorization specifically, um, next. I want to cover the current COVID-19 emergency use authorizations that have been put into place. Next slide. So I've provided a link to the FDA's homepage for emergency use authorizations. This includes up-to-date information on the existing emergency use authorizations with links to those letters of authorization, as well as frequent, frequently asked questions and links to other related information. Um, to date, actually, as of March 25th, it was 17, but now I think there's 19 or so um, EUAs issued for in vitro diagnostic test kits, and these can be accessed individually on the EUA webpage. There's also a, an EUA for NEOSH approved disposable filtering facepiece respirators, or FFRs. Uh, NEOSH, by the way, if, if you're not aware, stands for National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and there are certain standards and uh, performance criteria that must be met for to be approved as NEOSH approved. So this includes um, use of expired FFRs. And this particular EUA has an Appendix A, which lists all of the safety and effectiveness and labeling criteria that the FDA expects. And then Appendix B is a running list of all of the FFRs that actually are approved under the scope of this particular EUA. So Appendix B is updated continuously as the FDA reviews new FFRs and adds them to the list. There's also one for non-NEOSH approved FFRs, and this includes those that meet a stated performance standard or are approved in the European Union, Canada, Australia, or Japan. There's an EUA for ventilators, and this also includes anesthesia gas machines and positive pressure breathing devices that have been modified for use or may be modified for use as a ventilator, as well as ventilator tubing connectors and accessories. It covers devices that are not currently marketed in the US right now, as well as modifications to FDA cleared devices for which that modification would normally require a 510K to be reviewed by the FDA. There's also information for non-medical device manufacturers who have the capability to manufacture ventilators in this time of crisis. I do want to point out that each emergency use authorization is unique and it has its own criteria and requirements. Next, please. Um, however, there is information that's common to all of the existing EUAs in place, um, excluding those the diagnostic test kits. But the other device EUAs that have, that have been released all waive the current good manufacturing practice requirements, including those of the quality system uh, regulation with respect to the design, manufacture, packaging, labeling, storage, and distribution of the authorized device under each given EUA. They, are, they all also state that no descriptive printed matter, so i.e. labeling, relating to the use of the authorized device may represent or suggest that that product is safe or effective for the prevention of COVID-19. And that's because the FDA in this particular EUA situation is not giving the robust review um, for the safety and effectiveness that it normally would um, outside of this emergency situation. 
And then lastly, they all also have in common that they state that manufacturers of the author authorized device will have a process in place for reporting adverse events and sending those reports to the FDA. Next, please. So I want to go through some of the um, guidance document elements for an emergency use authorization. Next. I provided a link to the guidance document that was issued in 2017. Um, it uh, again allows the FDA to authorize emergency use via expedited evaluation of devices that have not been previously approved or cleared, as well as those that have are approved or cleared but for other uses. There's four criteria for an emergency use authorization of a medical countermeasure product. They are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Suffice it to, suffice it to say that COVID-19 meets all of these criteria. Um, the one I do want to point out right now is that the, uh, that the MCM must meet a standard of it may be effective which is a lower level of evidence than the normal effectiveness requirement um, under a normal situation. Next, please. So this information is clearly provided in a great more uh, detail in the guidance document itself, um, the general guidance document, as well as in the each device specific EUA. But in general, when you request a new emergency use authorization, you should include a description of the product and its intended use, the um, status of that device in the US as, as well as in other markets, the need for the product and what alternatives may exist, available scientific safety and effectiveness data on the product, the, um, uh, an assessment of the risks and benefits associated with its emergency use, and a summary of the manufacturing and quality controls. Next. In addition, information on the quantity of the product that is available, as well as the manufacturer's capabilities of making the product should be provided. Instructions for use. If it's for a device that is um, uh, asking for approval of use beyond its labeled shelf life or use life, you need data to support that use as well as a right of reference if you're going to be referencing data provided by another party that is used to support the use under the emergency use authorization. Next, please. Uh, first of all, on this slide, I want to point out that formal requests for new authorized uh, emergency use authorizations may be submitted by a government entity as well as industry whenever the uh, emergency situation has been declared. Um, if, we're, if, it's, if we're not currently in an emergency situation, but a, a company wants to prepare for a potential emergency use situation, then the FDA strongly encourages engaging uh, the, uh, the appropriate center in a pre-EUA discussion to um, consult with them on, on what would be needed. I also want to point out that an emergency use authorization is not a blanket approval for all devices of that device type. So that means that each manufacturer must submit a request to be included in an existing emergency use authorization scope. So for example, we uh, mentioned that there is a, an EUA for NEOSH approved FFRs. That does not mean that every NEOSH approved FFR is uh, allowed to be distributed for use in the United States. Each manufacturer must still submit the required information to the FDA for them to review it and decide whether that particular device can be added to Appendix B under the scope of the EUA. So each EUA letter of authorization that is published provides instructions on how to go about doing this. Um, and again, one, once again, I just want to point out that safety and effectiveness data is expected to be submitted in order to support that use. Next, please. Uh, some additional general information. The FDA will review and issue the, an EUA on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, heavily dependent, of course, on the priority of the need and the, of the device in question. Um, they will, the FDA will issue a letter of authorization, and of course, they may decline reviewing or issuing an EUA if the necessary criteria are not met. 
there is certain information that manufacturers uh, and conditions that manufacturers need to meet under an EUA. So they have to provide essential information to the users or recipients of the device. They have to implement and maintain required elements of good manufacturing practice or quality system regulation unless it's waived by the FDA. They must monitor and report adverse events and maintain adequate records of those devices that are shipped under the EUA. Uh, and they have to make those available to the FDA upon request. Next, please. An EUA is effective from the date the, that the FDA declares it's effective until they no, issue a notice of termination. And upon termination, it's important to realize that that device is no longer allowed for the emergency use or that particular use unless it has, in the meantime, obtained FDA clearance or approval through, through the normal process. However, of course, if the device is already cleared for another intended use, it can again be marketed uh, for that specific use. Next, please. For non-medical device manufacturers who wish to make a medical device in order to expand the supply of that device during a crisis, um, they are heavily encouraged to engage with the FDA to discuss the process and the needs. It's also important that uh, they realize that they have to follow the same requirements as do medical device manufacturers under a particular EUA. A quality management system relevant to medical devices, such as the FDA quality system regulation, needs to be implemented as applicable to the activity that they perform, again, unless the FDA has waived some or all of those requirements, which they have done in the case of um, most of the existing EUAs in place. They should evaluate and determine whether compliance to standards for sterilization, biocompatibility, human factors, cybersecurity, and other uh, relevant um, uh, situations are needed to support safety and effectiveness. And of course, this is dependent upon the type of device that they're making. Establishment registration of the, your facility may be needed. And again, just to reiterate that marketing that device um, is not allowed after termination of the EUA unless the proper clearance or approval has, has been obtained and you can show um, compliance to meeting the other regulatory obligations. Next, please. So previously, I, you know, a couple of times, I've said that effectiveness and safety data are required um, for an emergency use authorization. There, so there must be evidence that the device may be effective for its purpose. The evidence is going to be looked at in its totality. So as much as you can provide uh, to the FDA, the better. These are listed in order of the weight that they carry. So any type of clinical information is the, is, uh, carries the most weight. Um, and you should provide as much as you have available on any of these clinical, animal data, in vitro, bench testing, and then lastly, um, any available published literature that supports the use of that device. Next, please. Also, safety data needs to be provided. Again, test data is important. A risk-benefit analysis that shows that the risk are not uh, too severe and that the benefits outweigh any potential risks, a summary of the manufacturing controls that are in place, and labeling instru and instructions for use that, that uh, uh, are needed in order to use the device safely. I do wanna point out and emphasize that complying with relevant standards automatically infers a certain level of safety and effectiveness for the device. And if there's any doubt as to what type of of testing um, it, to perform on your device, the FDA encourages the manufacturers to engage in uh, a discussion with them on that. Next, please. So I just wanna to touch upon some other FDA policies that they have put into place for COVID-19. Next. They have issued a number of enforcement policies and an enforcement policy basically defines the enforcement discretions and alternatives that the FDA will use for a specified device. So currently um, they have a, a one in place for diagnostic tests for COVID-19. This describes two policies for accelerating the development of certain laboratory tests and the use of serological testing. Next, please. 
There's one for non-invasive remote monitoring devices, which allows modifications to be made to already cleared monitoring devices, such as thermometers, um, blood pressure devices, pulse oximeters, without requiring additional review by the FDA, which would normally be needed. Next, please. A third one is for ventilators and accessories and other respiratory devices. It includes uh, modifications that may be allowed for FDA cleared ventilators without receiving prior FDA approval or clearance, as long as those changes do not create undue risk. And so this is where it's important to provide that safety information. It allows the use of ventilators and breathing circuits beyond the labeled shelf or use life. Again, if that extension can be shown not to create undue risk. This enforcement policy points out that FDA does expect changes to be evaluated by the manufacturer and validated in accordance with design controls and relevant consensus standards. This particular enforcement policy is referenced in the emergency use author authorization for ventilators. Next, please. Uh, there's an enforcement policy for face masks. It uh, covers face masks with and without a liquid barrier protection with um, various types of uh, uh, requirements and criteria. Um, with regard to those with, with no liquid barrier protection, you can distribute those without prior 510K clearance and also without complying to the registration and listing requirements, the quality system, system regulation, unique device identification, and medical reporting. However, you do have to uh, provide it with the specified labeling. And for those with a liquid barrier protection, they must meet this ASTM standard and um, Code of Federal Regulation Part 1610 requirements. And I've provided an, an email address here that, uh, they, that the FDA provides for non-device manufacturers who are interested in making face masks to inquire of the FDA and uh, uh, engage them in discussion. Next, please. Okay, before I go on to this, actually, there is a, um, a fifth enforcement policy that the FDA just recently released, which did not make it onto this slideshow, but it's an enforcement policy for gowns, gloves, and other apparel. And as for the other enforcement policies, it lists the specific device categories covered and the FDA product codes. Um, and it has requirements for gowns providing both low barrier protection as well as those for moderate high protection and requirements for patient exam gloves and surgeon gloves. So that one is a new one that is now posted on the FDA's website as well. This last slide is simply a listing of other useful information regarding the COVID-19 emergency situation. The FDA has issued a series of frequently asked questions on shortages of medical gloves, as well as surgical masks and gowns and diagnostic testing for the coronavirus. Um, I provided a, uh, a listing of various email addresses that the FDA has provided for specific topics. So, um, you, you know, depending on the, the question or the type of device that you want information on, you would select the appropriate email. And then there is a couple of other existing um, sources of information as well that the FDA has, uh, has put forth. And then one more that didn't make it on there is that they have also um, published a letter to industry on importing personal protective equipment and other devices. And that uh, I believe is also listed on the FDA's website. Um, so with that, that finishes my part of the presentation and I will hand it over to Michael Wickland, uh, General Manager of Human Factors Research and Design. Yes, thank you very much, Audrey. And I see we both have the same model of headset, excellent. <laughs> Anyway, we, it's going to be a little bit of a change of pace now. I'm going to talk about human factors engineering of medical products, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective with all of you today. So this is a time when function is clearly more important than form. You've probably heard the expression form follows function, 
that's no more, never been more true than now. Uh, it's far more important, for example, that a ventilator or a mask uh, do its job. It's more important that it do, does its job than it is user friendly. As human factors specialists, my colleagues and I focus on how well a product fits the needs of the users and user friendliness, usability is a primary concern. But our primary focus and that of anybody working in any kind of R&D capacity, the primary concern should be on use, use safety, guiding effective product use and preventing mistakes that can be harmful or even deadly. And we all know that mistakes made while interacting with a medical device can, can be very serious. You've heard the expression, physician do no harm. Well, the mantra extends to medical devices. They should always help rather than hurt patients and healthcare professionals. And by applying human factors, even in these extreme times, can be very helpful. Therefore, at the time of COVID, I submit that we must maintain a focus on medical device use safety, and in doing so, potentially speed up the development process as opposed to slow it down. Next slide, please. Okay, but how? How do we attend to human factors, concerns, and not bog down the development process? For those of you who are less familiar with human factors engineering, it is the intersection of science and art, of design, engineering, and psychology. What human factors specialists do is they apply what is known about human beings, their physical capabilities, their intellectual cognitive capabilities, and they apply it to design so you have a good fit between um, what the product needs to do and how capable users will be in operating the device as intended. Normally the process as prescribed by regulators and particularly the FDA is quite substantial. And um, let me go back for a moment um, right there. Uh, the core activities are listed here. I won't read them to you, but in summary, we want to understand users and their needs, let their drive product requirements, then you go ahead and design a product in view of what the possible mistakes might be, what the risks are, and how you mitigate against those. Usability testing is our primary tool for evaluating whether people are indeed going to be able to interact safely and effectively with a product. And it's kind of a scary thought to put a device into use without doing that hands-on testing with users to see how things will go. And of course, normally, there's a requirement to submit data that your device can be used safely and effectively um, submitted to the FDA as well as other regulators. And the question is, Will that be expected now if one were going to quickly bring a product to market? I submit that probably not. This would probably be down in the lower hierarchy of needs in terms of rushing a product to market, but still there is value in practicing human factors as I'll explain. Next slide. You can see that um, human factors can be applied to all kinds of products. These are the kinds of products we've applied them to in our practice, and there are many other firms that do the same thing. The idea is that you can apply human factors to ensure that people using breathing apparatuses, delivering drugs, operating test kits will do so properly, do it effectively. There's no point running a test that is done improperly where a sample is contaminated where you might get a false negative, or false negative or false positive. All of these products should be reasonably intuitive to use. And perhaps people with little or no training should be able to use them when they're thrust into a situation where they must. These products should protect against what I would call egregious use errors that can be harmful. These products should be easy to reprocess and use again if that happens to be one of the specific use cases. Next slide, please. Now, I mentioned that regulators want to see human factors practiced energetically, at least during normal times. And their expectations are spelled out in these two particular documents that were published at first in 2016, but really follow up a 20 year effort on the FDA's part to ensure that human factors is applied properly. And their enforcement 
comes from a law that changed back in 1996, the quality system regulation said that users' needs must be reflected in a design solution. But how does that work today when we're trying to expedite products to market? Next slide, please. I'm gonna point out that medical error is another epidemic onto which the COVID crisis has been superimposed. Um, people have estimated that upwards of 251,000 people die each year due to medical error, and perhaps 15 to 20% of those errors might involve technology, as estimated by one of the past leaders of the Human Factors team at FDA. So, while we all focus on developing technology to address, address the pandemic, we, we need to remain vigilant about protecting against deadly medical errors. Next slide, please. Still, practicing good human factors sounds, sounds good. It sounds time consuming. And in fact, people can spend a lot of time, months and years, doing the human factors work associated with a product as complex, perhaps, as a intensive care ventilator. So what can companies do in expedite mode? Next slide, please. Well, what they can do is they can think about the most pressing interaction concerns. And one certainly is taking any piece of equipment and setting it up and getting it ready to use properly. And that can sometimes be a challenge. And they can think about how might people make mistakes when interacting with the product and try to put protections in place. They can think about rapid responses to emergencies. What are the scenarios where the product might be used that weren't necessarily anticipated when it was originally developed? And if you're implementing a design that's done, but for special purposes right now, again, those emergency scenarios are worth taking a look at in terms of the performance shaping factors of how people in the field will actually use the product. And effective reprocessing, again, is really important. Many of you have probably heard about the problem with duodenoscope reprocessing and there being germs left on these kinds of devices. And you need to think about how some of the products that are being rushed to market will or will not be cleaned properly. Ideally, cleaning is done automatically, but otherwise it takes a lot of effort to establish instructions or perhaps even a demonstration video on how to do it right. Next slide, please. We do need to prevent adverse events. I've listed just a few here that could potentially befall a device that was rushed to the market to help with some of the breathing uh, respiratory therapy types of conditions that, that are being addressed today. We've seen in usability tests, breathing circuits assembled incorrectly. We've seen cases where samples have been con contaminated uh, related to test kits. And we've actually done a lot of work on PPE and watched how people would either don and doff the equipment properly or not properly. And if they don't do it properly, of course, there's a potential for contamination. Next slide, please. So here's my last slide. And this is how would you go about expediting human factors engineering? One thing would be if you are actually working on a product that requires some design specifications before you start engineering and build it, really intensively consider the user interface requirements at that point and relate them very closely to what users need and want. You might base that on successful existing products or very rapid uh, user research by talking to the predominant users, finding out some of their basic requirements and trying to reflect those in product requirements. Next, to reach out to people who are specialists at user interface design. Our team does that kind of work, but many teams are out there that do that kind of work. Get a hold of the expert who can look at a device or drug delivery device or PPE and look at it from the user perspective with those special trained eyes to identify some low lying fruit in terms of ways to make sure that's going to work well in the hands of the users. That might be as simple as looking at the training or the instructions for use. And then there's this last technique, which is really the, the big tool in the human factors toolbox, which is usability testing. Many of you probably know about it. It's, a, it's taking a product for a test drive, so to speak. Very often it happens in a lab, such as shown in this image here on the screen right now, but it can be done with working prototypes that are presented over the web even. And there are many ways in which 
with the limitations of COVID, we can do remote evaluation of products. You can do them or you can reach out to resources who can help you with that. So that's, that's my advocacy position that human factor still counts even during this crisis where we're trying to expedite products to market. And I'll turn it back to Stuart. Thank you very much, Michael and Audrey for your information. We're now switching over to the testing and certification side of the fence. First, we'll have James Benscotter, our senior staff engineer, who will address key standards and certification testing for non-medical device manufacturers. And then we'll wrap up with Anuro Fernando, our chief innovation architect of medical systems, interoperability, and security, who will explain some cybersecurity risk management issues uh, surrounding the COVID-19 issue. James? Thank you, Stuart. Yes, as mentioned earlier by Audrey, the need for compliance with applicable standards really was pointed out in the EUA for a ventilator. And when we start to think about that, given the fact that the FDA in the EUA is looking at the device's safety and effectiveness, how does that play into the discussion? Can you go to the next slide, please? The group that I work in uh, for Life and Health Sciences at UL, we do testing and certification work. So we're the ones that actually come along and use these relevant standards that you'll see referenced in the EUA documents to do an evaluation to understand whether the device is safe and effective. When people typically come to UL and they think about these different standards that are out there, a lot of times people have the understanding that the standard is really looking for your, your basic safety, your electric shock and fire protection um, items that they may be used to seeing if they've done work on other products. However, in a lot of the medical standards for electrical medical devices, we'll get a lot more and they'll actually get into whether the device is effective. And that can kind of lead into why in the EUA, they're still talking about seeing effort, information to show compliance with these relevant standards. Next slide, please. So let's get into standards and try to uh, help everyone understand why the standards are important and, and go through some of the different requirements and what is involved with these standards. Next slide, please. When we start talking about standards for regulatory compliance, they really form a basis for your regulatory submission, whether it be an EUA submission or whether it be your just typical 510K submission. They're looking for some evidence that a minimum level of safety has been met. And when we talk about these standards, they really are driving that minimum level of safety. When we talk about the devices that we would typically see uh, around the, the, the COVID-19 situation, we really get into two basic electrical device standards that we uh, see submitted on a regular basis. First, is devices submitted that would fall under the standard ES60601 plus its collaterals and particulars. This is a series of standards that provides everything from making sure your device doesn't cause electric shock to the user, electric shock to the patient, all the way down to looking at whether the device correctly reads the amount of CO2 that the patient uh, uh, exhales during use of a ventilator, or whether there's an SpO2 sensor how well that device will actually measure the, uh, the oxygen saturation in the blood. Additionally, we'll have devices that will be more for the analysis. And this comes down to where you start talking about some of the, the test kits. And you'll see a lot of these devices when they actually talk about the device that processes and uses these tests to determine if someone has COVID-19 or, or any other one uh, such as uh, flu A type flu type A or type B will fall under the requirements of UL 61010 plus the relevant particulars. Now when you'll notice when I say the word particular and collaterals, uh, particulars the best way to think about it is very specific requirements for a specific device. So when we're talking about ventilators for example, the 601 series of standards actually has three different categories of ventilators, whether they be critical care, that's one type, or where they go into the next step and they go into the home use ventilators that may, uh, depending upon the level of breathing that the patient needs, will fall into two other buckets. Additionally, it'll have other standards that'll come into play also, uh, such as alarm requirements, uh, looking for electromagnetic compatibility. Now, as mentioned earlier, 
the amount of development and work that goes into uh, showing compliance to all these standards can be quite large. Uh, the number of testing, number of, of items to go through can be uh, quite substantial. And this is where discussion with the FDA to understand what those standards are and what you can accomplish um, depending on the time frame would need to be discussed individually on the device to determine whether full compliance, full testing compliance, or some derivative in between is necessary to address all of the relevant requirements. Next slide, please. Really, when we get into these specific standards, they can reference other standards. So if you were to look at the EUA for ventilators, for example, you'll see a reference to a standard IEC 60601, which is used as the basis for ES 60601. Within that standard itself, it will make reference to other standards, such as IEC 62304 for software development. And that is found in clause 14.1 of the 601 standard. So you can start to see in the, in the, EUA, in the EUA for ventilators, you'll see the 60601 standards, and then you'll see this reference to 62304. In this case, it already was inferred based on the, on based on the base standard. However, they still felt it was necessary to call it out. Now, a key point to make out of that is there still can be other standards available to the device. And this is where you get out, you get into the non-device requirements and you get into such as uh, biocompatibility, uh, different type of tubing set designs that may be called out in other standards. So really the first thing that needs to be done is when you're starting to develop a product, even in a time like this, you need to identify what you're gonna have to comply with because the FDA is gonna expect for you to have some understanding of what you're going to do to comply from a standard standpoint. And that all comes back to the intended use of the device. The more devices we see from manufacturers, the more features or functionality that they may have. And these additional functionalities can require additional standards. So in the EUA for ventilators, for example, they actually make a reference, a general reference to other standards in the 601 series. You know, it's kind of one of those general because they understand that they can't cover every situation. Now, when we get into doing the evaluation, it becomes a question of manufacturers like, well, what do I need to provide? What should I have in my back pocket as a methodology to provide evidence of compliance? And so let's, let's talk about that now. Next slide, please. This is an example of a typical IECE CB scheme style report. These reports will typically document clause by clause, how your device complies with relevant remarks explaining why something may be not applicable. It may have information about where the evidence was found of compliance. So if I was doing a clause 14, which, was, which is regards to software, I may be referencing a software architecture requirement. So I'll probably wanna reference the software architecture document that was reviewed to show compliance. Same thing with, with critical components may be documented in there along with test data. So really when you get this, this one style of report, it gives you the ability to have all the relevant compliance information in one spot. So you're not uh, trying to pull different documents from different spots. You have one uh, concise list of information. Next slide, please. When we do an evaluation within these documents, you'll see there's a lot of inputs and there's a lot of things that, that feed into this process. But the key I, I wanted to point out in this, in this little picture here is that the evaluation process doesn't need to be a serial process. A lot of people tend to think the process needs to be serial. Um, there are some contingencies uh, within this process. Example, if there's certain test conditions that the standard requires that you can't de de determine the test condition until you have done a document review of the risk management file or you may not understand how uh, the device complies with a specific construction requirement until you've reviewed some software documentation and had that discussion. So the these processes can be done in parallel, um, but they do require a lot of interaction between parts. So it's a, it's a lot of different items coming together to get you to the end point where you have one specific document that provides the relevant evidence. Uh, next slide, please. With regards to standards, uh, once somebody gets a device evaluated, the question always comes up, what has to happen afterwards? And as we saw in the EUA uh, declaration for ventilators, the FDA recognizes that people may start to do uh, 
uh, production at other sites and or try to ramp up their production, which may lead to uh, a lack of uh, parts that are necessary to build the unit. So this means the manufacturer is going to have to validate that the parts that they're choosing as replacements still make the device safe and effective as it originally was. The, the EUA is just saying, you don't have to submit it to us and ask for permission um, formally to go through the full review, but you need to have done your, uh, I'll call it due diligence and done your relevant evaluation to make sure it happens. The key here is the evaluation typically isn't always on uh, a full repeat of everything. It's really focused on what needs to be evaluated based on the specific part in change. So if I'm changing uh, a pump on, let's say, a, a hemodialysis unit, I know that there are very specific requirements with regards to testing that that would need to be repeated. So within every situation, it needs to be reviewed. What were the standards used? What could be affected by it? And then determine what needs to be done to validate that that part is a suitable substitute. Next slide, please. Quality management system is just another part of the whole regulatory landscape when we talk about standards. Uh, this is just another part that needs to be done to have relevant uh, processes in place that actually will feed in and, and mix nicely with some of the other standards referenced in there. Uh, with regards to quality management, 1345 is the most uh, accepted and general uh, quality management system. Uh, the, to do a true audit of 1345, it does require an on-site uh, inspection. Uh, one of the key notes is you'll notice a couple times in Audrey's discussion is that they still do have requirements for re uh, monitoring of devices and proper reporting on devices, even when a device is being built by someone who may not normally have a full quality system, they're still outlining requirements that net needs to be addressed. Next slide, please. So let's talk about certifications. And this is where we get into uh, your typical certification mark that you'll see on units. So let's go to the next slide. We talk about certifications. In the US market, we're looking at a NR, NRTL mark, which is Nationally Recognized Testing Laboratory. These marks are issued uh, by agencies under the approval of OSHA. And really this is looking for providing some level of audit and control on the lab that did the work to ensure that the devices being made meet a minimum level of safety. And a lot of times when we do the evaluation to a consensus standard that may be required by the FDA, it may be one of the standards that's also eligible for this mark. The marks really come into play uh, when we talk about workplace safety compliance from an OSHA. A lot of hospitals will have different regulatory requirements of what they will accept on devices. Also, it is important for authorities having jurisdiction if they're gonna, if your device is of such nature that it is permanently installed. The NRTL mark does require verification uh, that a device is built as described and tested. So you kind of think of that as a, as a mini audit and it does occur on site, but it is different than the quality management system, which would be a, a separate activity. So with that, uh, we can go to the next slide, please. And I will hand it over to uh, Nura Fernando, who will now talk to you about cybersecurity. Thanks a lot, James, appreciate it. If we could go to the next slide, please. So you may ask yourself, you know, why are we talking about cybersecurity during this pandemic? And the issue is that unfortunately, there are a lot of bad actors out there still, threat actors as they're called in the world of cybersecurity. And they're taking advantage of, of the situation that's currently going on. Since January, we've seen at least 15 distinct phishing campaigns from 11 different threat actors or groups that have been distributing 39 different types of malware families, including 80 different attack patterns. Um, some recent numbers say that there are uh, around 6,200 indicators of compromise, meaning the systems have been breached uh, since the beginning of this year. And so 
with healthcare being critical infrastructure that, that supports society during times like this, uh, we have to make sure to protect it against uh, some of the types of malware that you see here that have been created in some cases with names like Corona and COVID that are specifically targeting um, people who are interested in solving these problems. Next slide, please. So why would somebody hack a medical device? You know, what do they have to gain? Well, first is um, a financial gain where PII and PHI can, can really yield uh, 10 to 20 times more than a credit card number, for example, um, that has significant economic value. Um, another thing is intellectual property or IP theft, you know, stealing algorithms, for example, that people have been developing for years or decades. Um, they may want to cause brand or reputational damage or build notoriety, or a, a, an important one is pivoting to other assets in the hospital environment um, beyond the device itself that has kind of served as a gateway into the rest of the hospital. Um, from a nation state perspective, uh, people are sometimes trying to probe our critical infrastructure uh, to perhaps launch things like combination attacks where you have a physical attack and a cyber attack. And in some cases, it's uh, for co-opting distributed computing resources for things like botnets and ransomware and so forth. Next slide, please. And so to keep these threat actors away, there are some fairly basic things that you can do, kind of like uh, basic hygiene, if you will. And so from an information security point of view, uh, you want to look at a certain set of things, but also from a product security point of view, you want to look at a certain set of things. And so you want to make sure that your network, especially if you're a healthcare provider, address both IT security and product security. And many people think that those are kind of the, you know, the same thing, security is security. It's, it's fundamentally not. There are some very different things about managing security on a network and IT systems uh, versus product security. Uh, but there are also a lot of commonalities, like making sure you keep your patches up to date, you know, whether you're um, general purpose computing infrastructure or medical device. Um, and for products in particular, there are a number of things you can do. You can do things like static source code analysis to identify weaknesses. And we've seen these, uh, these kinds of activities for decades now in um, FDA guidance, uh, going back to looking at, at just software defects in general before cybersecurity even became a major issue. Um, to then newer things like uh, scanning for specific security vulnerabilities and tying those back to your software bill of materials so that when compromises do occur, you can trace back to, to the issues and, and having a transparent um, incident response process where you can identify those kinds of things and deal with them is, is very important. Next slide, please. And so we'll take a look, you know, many of you out there are innovators, you're working with um, medical device manufacturers from academia to see how to tackle these problems. Um, you heard um, Audrey talking earlier about making modifications to ventilators, for example, and here we'll see how communication uh, capability can be one of those, uh, those modifications that can be very useful for isolation. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll see where the starting point is. So we talked quite a bit about you know, quality management systems and, and quality processes. Having a systems engineering process drive the development effort or drive the modification effort can be, can be key because that allows you to, to not only get the, the core elements of a quality management system in place and drive that technical consistency and drive towards safety and effectiveness, um, but it also gives you a path to make very quick decisions by having some key elements documented. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. Next slide, please. So the first piece of a systems engineering process is to understand the problem. So when you think about what attributes you want to design into a product, it's important to recognize you know, what the source of the problem is. In this case, we see you know, the, the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, can actually embed in the lungs. It can cause an immune response that causes more fluid to be drawn in. And so there can be greater levels of hydrostatic pressure that need to be overcome and things like that as a core part of the design. Secondly, we see that isolation is a critical aspect of dealing with this problem. 
And so having things like remote communication capability can really enhance the ability to, to isolate and, and minimize exposure. Next slide, please. And so when we start to look at this, this effort, looking at the system from the perspective of what it should be doing can help us to understand what the system should be resistant to and what it should be able to protect itself from, including things like cyber attack. So the first step is to understand the basic process that your device is, is dealing with, in this case, breathing, having your brain drive your muscular system and your skeletal system and having signals back from your peripheral nervous system and so forth, all focused on driving oxygen into your body and getting um, carbon dioxide and so forth out. Next slide, please. And so understanding some of the key parameters that you want to be able to control, even from a remote control perspective for isolation, for example, you need to understand what those key parameters are. What is it that the clinician is going to need to be able to adjust? Is it pressure? Is it flow? Um, how does that relate to lung volume and so forth? Next slide, please. And so then when you start to think about how do I design a product to do this, this function that my body normally does, you start to think in terms of engineering. And then you start to think, you know, mapping this to a physiological and anatomical system is what I'm doing, is what I'm proposing to build, and is my control structure really sufficient? Have I thought about all the inputs from a safety and effectiveness point of view and from a quality point of view? Next slide, please. And so, once you've figured these things out, you know, there, there are a lot of things to consider. You heard about some of the electrical safety issues and mechanical safety issues and usability issues and regulatory considerations before. Um, then you're, you're in a good position to, to really think about how am I going to implement this? You know, I need something to pump air in the case of a ventilator. I need something to move the pump. I need something to control exactly how it moves so I keep my pressure and volume and all those, those changes uh, at the right levels. Next slide, please. So taking that systems engineering process and driving it to the implementation of an engineered product that's starting to mimic the physiological system is, is really the main objective. Next slide, please. And so we said that in addition to traditional features of these products in times of, of a crisis like this, when, when we're dealing with trying to minimize exposure, adding features like communication capability can be very, very useful in minimizing that exposure. And so we saw, uh, Audrey mentioned before, some of the enforcement uh, documents that FDA has put out as well. And here they say very specifically that things like uh, Bluetooth and wireless capability to drive that, um, that type of remote access and remote control uh, is, is being facilitated. However, you still need to make sure that things like cybersecurity are addressed because you want to protect that critical infrastructure. You want to make sure that those uh, you know, 39 groups that we saw before aren't potentially hacking into this, uh, this healthcare facility through the product that you've innovated. Next slide, please. And so as you move forward with developing the, the product uh, with, with all of these understandings, recognizing that you know, it's not just a matter of throwing together some code. You have to understand not only the structure of the code itself, but also the tools that are being used to develop the code and recognizing that those aren't introducing errors or defects or vulnerabilities into the system. Um, those are some key elements that need to be looked at. Next slide, please. And so it's important to consider safety and security together. They're, they're really inseparable. You have to think about when you look at your control structure, what could go wrong and what can be disturbed. So from a safety perspective, you know, there are a lot of things that, that could happen like electromagnetic interference and, and kind of random things like that. From a cybersecurity perspective, there might be somebody out there targeting, trying to look for um, open ports and services and, and hospital infrastructure that they can get into. Next slide, please. And so as we think about all of these things that could go wrong and, and how they could go wrong, either through you know, just natural effects or through malicious intent, 
um, it's important to understand that when you create a product like this, um, it has some inherent risk with it. For example, if you don't drive the parameters correctly, you know, you could have fairly innocuous events like edema and things like that at the lung level if, if you're not, um, you know, ventilating properly. But it could also be as, as severe as, you know, total organ system failure and, and death. And so the thing that you're trying to introduce to help could actually be hurting. So understanding that that whole risk profile and the risk benefit is, is very, very important, as was mentioned before. Next slide, please. And so when you think about all of these risks, you know, it's important to think about the fact, uh, some of you may remember a few years ago, um, hackers would hack into things like printers, you know, that, that we print documents with, and they would overdrive motors and set those devices on fire. And so when you think about your medical device that you're trying to innovate or, or modify, uh, thinking about attack vectors that could affect basic safety is, is just as important as what we call essential performance or the functionality. Next slide, please. And so thinking about how the data and the product, you know, could potentially be exfiltrated, how malware could be introduced even through things, you know, processes like patching, which are normally good things, and making sure that you have a plan to deal with all of those things and to, and to mitigate them to the extent possible out of the gate is a really good way to go. Next slide, please. And so starting off with the threat model, as you think about these innovations, whether they're new product development efforts or modifications to existing products, understanding what your, your threat environment looks like, who's going to be trying to act against you, what vulnerabilities might exist in your technology, what the impact of exploitation of those technologies might be, and what the overall risk is, and, and weighing that and that risk benefit ratio that uh, Audrey talked about before uh, is very, very important. Next slide, please. And so having this kind of a threat model can actually accelerate things, even though it's a little bit of documentation up front and a little bit of record keeping. But then when you're in the middle of design, you can make some very quick design decisions and say, okay, um, here are my issues. I just need to encrypt all my data, authenticate and, and authorize, and I should be in good shape. You know, it could end up as simple as that if, if you've got a robust threat model. Next slide, please. And so that was an example of the kind of innovation that can occur and what needs to be considered from a risk management perspective when you're innovating. Um, next slide, please. What we'll now take a look at is uh, another aspect of this, which is telemedicine. So while there are these risks of you know, communicating medical devices and so forth, telemedicine in general can really help to uh, provide that social distancing that we need to keep patients at home, to allow uh, them to, to have um, other problems treated uh, while people that may be treated with COVID-19 have to be in the, the hospitals themselves, and thereby keeping you know, these different populations of people, of patients um, separated from each other. So telemedicine is about using uh, communication technology and infrastructure along with communication-enabled medical devices and uh, propagating that information throughout the healthcare ecosystem uh, so that you can provide the best possible remote care. Next slide, please. And so in order to move in this direction, you know, this isn't a new, new topic. It's been talked about for a number of years, even going back prior to this, into the 2008, 2009 timeframe. But during, uh, through the span from 2014 to 2017, there were a number of regulatory actions and, and things involving the regulators that happened to drive toward having telemedicine technologies more widely available in the, in the marketplace. And now we see a lot of benefit from that as uh, you, know, you, you see conveniences like being able to go pick up your groceries and as you're preparing to isolate at home, and then even having telemedicine kiosks right there in the grocery store, so that if you do have a sore throat or something like that, you can have it quickly analyzed and uh, triaged and make determinations, you know, whether you need COVID testing or if you just need antibiotics or what the case may be. Next slide, please. And so there are, as Audrey mentioned before too, a number of tools uh, from FDA, but in addition to that, 
uh, there's some legislation and executive actions and things like that to help drive telemedicine forward and, and make um, reimbursement, for example, possible through uh, the CMS, uh, Medicare and Medicaid services. Um, when you see payers start to support telemedicine, that's another big impetus toward that technology rapidly moving forward. Next slide, please. So when we think about using these types of technologies as well that are kind of newer to the marketplace, it's really important that we're mindful of the whole ecosystem and safety and security. Remember when we looked back at, at why would somebody hack a device? Well, sometimes they want access to that ecosystem. So thinking about securing all of those access points is a really critical aspect of, of healthcare and cybersecurity. Next slide, please. So Underwriters Laboratories is, is here to help with these kinds of situations. And uh, as you've heard before, we can support these, these activities with testing and certification that are relative to safety and, and um, security. We can look at uh, risk mitigation and, and management of products, supply chains, and, and even cybersecurity. We can help keep your supply chains viable during this, this time of crisis. And, and that's what it's all about. It's keeping things moving. Um, helping to keep exposure down, helping to uh, have the, the vulnerable parts of this population deal with these problems. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Stuart for our Q&A. Thank you very much, Anura and James, for covering the testing and certification as well as cybersecurity issues uh, around this topic. Uh, at this time, we open the floor to questions from the audience for any and or all of our speakers. So please feel free to do so. I will um, start things off with a very high level question posed to, to everyone. Uh, as the non-medical manufacturing sector gets more involved um, in, in this space, this is a lot of information coming at them at once in terms of getting familiar with what kind of uh, compliance and what kind of systems and processes need to be in place to to help out. Um, based on what you all have seen so far, is there a basic roadmap or checklist that you might be able to recommend to a non-medical manufacturer in order in terms of what to do first and when and and things like that? Um, is it is that early days, or do you see um, do you see something emerging yet? This is Michael Wicklund. You know, I I actually faced that. I was in that situation uh, just yesterday, where our team was communicating with a manufacturer of something very different than a medical device, and they were thinking that there was a great opportunity to take their manufacturing capability and start producing products. And my recommendation was to very quickly get in touch with uh, healthcare providers, specifically experts on the medical side of what that device does. In this case, it was a ventilator. My recommendation was to get in touch with a very technology oriented uh, anesthesiologist who knew the industry and uh, understood the mechanics of ventilators and could start establishing some a baseline of how the device should function and whether there was an opportunity to use other kinds of devices to pr provide the ventilator function or whether it made more sense to reach out to folks already building those and just seeing how they could help out from a manufacturing line standpoint. So I if, if a company doesn't have a medical director per se, I would immediately reach out to the medical experts who can complement the engineer's viewpoints when thinking about how to move forward. If I could add to that also, um, you know, standards are, are often developed, especially you know, national consensus standards and so forth and international standards are developed by groups of, of experts in a certain type of product or you know, a certain uh, technical domain that's being covered by the standard. And so taking a look at standards and, and reviewing the contents of these standards can be very useful in terms of, of mining technical data that can be used in uh, new development efforts and, and understanding the risks of those products and so forth. And, and I, I, I'm sorry. Oh, ahead, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, if, if 
you're manufacturing a device that currently is under an emergency use authorization to definitely uh, access that EUA, um, read it, become familiar with it, uh, reach out to the FDA if you have questions related to what the EUA is asking for. Um, you know, I, I think again, as, as Michael said, it, it would be important to try to get a, an understanding from a medical professional who, uh, you know, is a user of that device or from a technical um, specialist who understands the technology of that device. But then reading the actual emergency use authorization or the enforcement policy related to that device and reaching out to the FDA if necessary. And that's something from the consulting um, side of Emergo by UL, uh, you know, if, if needed, we can offer um, support in that area as well. I guess I will say this is from, from the testing side, we've had a couple interactions already with customers, uh, specifically talking about some of the lead time on some of the items that they've had to go back to the FDA. And I, they ended up coming up with some agreement on how to proceed forward. Because when you start looking at some of the items referenced, even like in the ventilator standard, and you start digging into uh, some of the, the requirements, you can have items that can take longer term items that you may need to have some agreement on. But the best thing is once you have the relevant medical experts and you understand your device is, is to have that discussion to hammer out those details before you go too far down the road. Great, thank you everyone for that input. Uh, next question from the audience. Uh, as a university, we are working on the design and development of PPEs, N95s, face shields, and gowns. Is it required that university files for FDA clearance or approval um, will be handed to, so, that is to say, will some of these um, emergency approvals be handed to smaller manufacturers for larger production? I'm not clear I understand yes. that question. Yes. I'm sorry. Let me, let me research. Maybe Irfan, you can go ahead and ask it a little bit more directly, but I think it's about the design versus the manufacturer of who has to submit for FDA approval. Yeah, so yeah, that's what Laura, yeah, Laura, yeah, I'm saying that does the university need to file for FDA approval while working on the design or redesign of these? And eventually the thought is that this will go to local manufacturers who would produce it, but we may be producing some copies of those within within uh, the 3D printing here on the university and then give it over to our local hospitals. So would we be governed by any of the FDA approval pro process? So generally, I believe as is the case under a normal situation, the entity who needs to um, submit the device for clearance from the FDA is the entity who is responsible ultimately for the design and controls of that um, product. So if, it, if that's the manufacturer, you know, an outside manufacturer who is going to take um, the university's initial design but actually develop the final specifications and the manufacturing processes and controls and um, uh, distribute it, for example, under their own name, then that would probably be the, the uh, actual outside manufacturer. But we'll be producing some copies, like 2,000 units of these, say, to N95s uh, or the gowns uh, before they are handed over to the manufacturer. So my question is, if you are within the university system, is it still needed approval? Uh, yes, it's my understanding that yes, it would be. If those products are intended to be distributed for use by you know, uh, healthcare professionals or patients, um, then yes, they would still need to have some evaluation from the FDA at that point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Next question uh, is more along the lines of cybersecurity. And that would be um, whether the cybersecurity considerations that Anura you went over earlier um, should only be considered for devices uh, connected to other devices or healthcare systems. Uh, this is specifically pertinent given the types of devices and supplies that are being are coming up short in this particular emergency. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, understanding the risk profile in emergency situations is, is pretty unique. And uh, when you look at at the overall attack surface, you have some things that can be remotely attacked, you know, using um, the IP address, for example, if it's an, if it's an internet facing device and, and so forth. And, and other attack vectors really require local access, local physical access, things like USB attacks, um, attacks that, that get at the internals of, of the product, you know, uh, diagnostic ports and things like that that are in the products. And so I think, you know, it would be reasonable to, to make an argument, especially for regulatory purposes, that um, only the more remote uh, types of attacks would be considered and that uh, some of the more local types of attacks like USB and, and so forth, if there are sufficient, you know, the equipments to be used in a, a, a facility where you have physical access controls and you have security policies and, and people know not to stick, you know, random USB sticks and medical devices and things like that, uh, you could try to make that kind of an argument. And I think in an emergency situation, that would be reasonable. Although in, you know, normal situations, people, uh, you know, air gap systems have been breached and, and they will continue to be breached. And so the fact that you, you have uh, a need for local access really doesn't mitigate the issue in general. The risk benefit may come out okay in this case. And, and so I would certainly factor that into the risk benefit analysis. Thank you, Anora. Sure. Uh, we've had a few questions and concerns about um, non-medical manufacturers who produce, say, a ventilator or what have you under an EUA, and then that EUA ex expires. Um, is there some kind of process in place that affected companies um, could rely on in terms of what happens after that expiration? And specifically, what is required of those manufacturers as well as of the end users who have been using those uh, EUA authorized devices? So the EUAs actually specify that the device um, that is being used under that EUA, once the EUA is terminated, to be destroyed, uh, removed from use and destroyed, if it's not already approved, of course, for some other use that it could be, um, you know, put in put in use for that particular uh, cleared or approved use. So I don't know if there's a method by, of, by which the FDA will somehow try to ensure that this uh, takes place, but basically it's up to the manufacturer, I believe, and the um, healthcare facility to ensure that any device which is being implemented specifically for an emergency use situation, whereby the normal controls and approval processes um, have been waived to remove that device from that, that situation once the EUA is terminated. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, I would welcome any question directly from the audience or I will resume the, the question submitted via chat. Anyone? Okay. So the next question is a hypothetical. Uh, assuming that today a team developed a new ventilator that met all safety and security requirements, did not require any redesign. So if all necessary paperwork were submitted to FDA today, about or approximately how long would it take FDA to actually approve or clear that, that ventilator for clinical use, roughly? Well, I think we would need our crystal ball, um, but uh, 
that's you know that that's difficult to say. Um, I am not aware of data to date that indicates how long the FDA has taken to review and uh, you know a review the current ventilators that are approved under an emergency use situation. So I don't have that information available. It may be available somewhere, um, but I have not have not come across it. Uh, I know that the, the, the uh, document says it, it may take hours or it could take days. Um, clearly the FDA is interested in reviewing the uh, requests as quickly as possible. Um, it's also very important to ensure that those requests include all of the expected information for the device that's laid out in a particular emergency use authorization uh, letter. Um, so th yeah, that, that's, that's not really possible to answer. All I can say is that uh, it's expected to be days rather than weeks or months. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, we have time for, oh, actually, we just got a new question. I'll, I'll put that ahead. If we were to make uh, 100,000 simple plastic face shields, would we have to track down 100,000 samples for destruction at the end of the, of a hypothetical emergency use authorization? That's a very good question. Um, again, I don't have a, a, a good answer for that. Um, I think that if there are, are devices still undistributed in inventory, then those devices obviously would need to be destroyed. Once they have been distributed and are outside of the control of the manufacturer and in a, 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 um, a healthcare facility and, you know, it's, it's really up to the healthcare facility to maintain um, their inventory and know where those devices are used. Um, so I think the intent is that they be removed, but in that particular situation with that type of device, quite honestly, I'm not, again, I'm not clear as to how that would take place. I don't think the FDA has put any specifics into, into place to account for that. So again, a good question, and it's certainly something that would be worth, uh, potentially trying to dig deeper with the FDA to find out how that would, how that would occur and what their expectation would be. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we will go ahead and try to squeeze one final question in uh, pertaining to the human factors and usability side of things. Um, basically, how should uh, manufacturers, whether medical or non-medical, go about approaching issues such as usability testing and certain more hands-on elements of human factors engineering, um, given our current social distancing environment, uh, as well as in, in consideration of uh, EUA authorizations from FDA that may kind of jump uh, jumpstart certain registration processes. Right. Well, I don't have any signal right now from the human factor specialists at FDA indicating whether they would still uphold their expectations for validation usability test. That's where you get typically a minimum of 15 people who would use the product representing one of potentially many distinct user groups. You get those people to interact with the product and see how a task goes. You observe in a very structured way, see how well they're able to get through use scenarios and see whether critical mistakes occur or not. And if they do occur, it's an indication that there's a need to revise the design or the instructions or the training. My sense is that the FDA would not uh, create barriers to rushing a product to market because it didn't have adequate usability testing, but I don't know that for sure. What I do know, though, is that there's many good reasons to do at least some usability testing. And so the challenge now becomes, how do you do that when normally you would invite uh, healthcare professionals or even lay people to interact with the product in a natural way? Um, presently, 
we are advocating various remote testing approaches where you use the internet to give yourself some virtual presence and you help direct people through an evaluation of the product in as hands-on a manner as possible, sometimes shipping them some prototypes, sometimes asking them to go somewhere, but that's going to be fairly unusual right now. Another way that I would imagine one could do usability testing is have people within the manufacturing uh, company serve as test participants to the extent that they can, given that they might already be in that environment and they're not incurring additional risk. Now, this is normally not the way to do things. The FDA, in fact, says do not use your employees, friends and family to be your test participants. Reach out, get a very accurate sample of the real intended users. But I would imagine that this amount of usability testing in a stopgap kind of way would probably be well received. It's something I would want to talk directly with the FDA about in some sort of advisory session. So I would reach out them to them for, for an absolute answer on that question. But doing hands-on testing with very physical products, that's how I would do it. Um, if it's a product that can be presented or perhaps even instructions can be presented for interpretation over the web, that's what we're doing right now. In many cases, we're running remote usability tests of products. And this is not just for products that people are trying to bring to the market to address the COVID crisis, but also products that they had in development going through the normal steps and now they, they, they feel like they're reaching a, an obstacle being how do I do what's required, the usability testing to bring other kinds of products to market? Well, that's one way to do it. Uh, we don't know how long we'll have to do it that way. And we don't know the extent to which the FDA will accept the data, um, but we're working on the answer. Great. Thank you, Michael. And thank you everyone for your uh, questions that you submitted and thanks very much to our speakers today. And I'll turn it back to Laura for some closing remarks. Hi, this is Laura Ferrex back from the University of Illinois Research Park and the Urbana campus. We wanted to provide some resources for those of you who are small businesses on the phone. Um, scheduled very uh, soon thereafter, we had scheduled our, our own session, NSF had today a webinar on the rapid response research funding opportunity that provides up to $200,000 in funding for COVID-19 technologies. And they are seeking new submissions from companies who have this rapid proposal system. And we also know that there is a opportunity to submit SBIR funding phase one proposals, and that can provide up to $256,000. If you're interested in pursuing these, we do have free consultants to help through the Illinois University Incubator Network and through the Research Park. And there's a link uh, that we'll provide that shows how to request those consulting hours for those that are already act actively working on some of these submissions. And of course, the Small Business Administration of the US government has a variety of resources online. Next slide. Just a couple of other thoughts for the larger and manufacturing companies that are on the phone. In Illinois, the Illinois Manufacturing Association, IMA, is working to identify potential suppliers that will help the first responders and health providers throughout the state. So I'd encourage you to take a look at their website. And iBio, the state's life sciences organization, is looking for both donations financially as well as ways to try to be able to sort out who has the greatest need for these types of supplies across the state of Illinois through IEMA. And then lastly, a shout out to some of our other incubator peers in the state of Illinois, including M Hub Matter and 1871 in the Chicago area that are working to identify experts and innovators interested in contributing. So I'd like to really thank, I think as we conclude um, on our final slide, just to say thank you. Um, we're really grateful to have all the experts from UL and Amerigo here today to be able to give you some guidance on these detailed subject matters that really require people in many cases that have, have seen this before and have a lot of wealth of information and we're happy that UL is a company based in the state of Illinois and we as the University of Illinois, we're happy to have you here today. So thank you for everybody who's been working on new technologies. We're wrapping up with some examples of cool projects that have been happening both at the University of Illinois, at Northwestern, at UMHUB, and of course, a large company in the state of Illinois, Abbott, has received significant attention this week for their, their new diagnostics tools.
So thank you. You'll have our contact information, a PDF, and a link eventually to this webinar as soon as it's re rendered so that you can receive this content in more detail. Thank you.